Hey, everybody. I'm Todd Dills, editor of Overdrive, and happy to be hosting this session today. A big thanks here to you for joining us for a presentation and discussions that's part of a long-running uh, program that we've uh, done with, uh, over, with, uh, with ATBS for many years now. It's the Partners in Business program. Uh, ATBS is a small an owner-operated business services firm, and our special guest here today is none other than ATBS president, Todd Amon, who's going to be running through a wealth of data against which you can benchmark your own business. We're talking bedrock owner-operator business performance data, average costs of various types, revenue, and ultimate income, broken out in most cases by segment, depending on the trailer type. All of it's valuable for real-time trends intelligence from among the thousands of ATBS owner-operator clients. ATBS, at its most basic description, is an owner-operator tax specialist and also performs a range of other business services for clients that I'll let Todd Amon tell you about in just a minute. Before we bring him in, though, and get rolling with his presentation, a couple of quick housekeeping items. As Todd Amon gets through his slides and talk and all of that data, if you see something there that spawns a question you want to ask, you can type in questions in the chat if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're on our website, overdriveonline.com, use the comment function near the bottom of the page to drop a question there. Our social media coordinator, Holly Young, is monitoring those and will send those to me to get answers. And Holly, if you could drop a link for attendees in the chat and the comment section to our 2021 Partners Business Manual, I'd appreciate it. We've been producing that business guide for new and more seasoned owner operators for well more than a decade at this point, updating it every year as regulations and business best practices change with new content in consultation with ATBS. It's available in electronic form for any interested owner operator as a free download. So check it out. Okay, Todd Amen, uh, big thanks for joining us here. I'm going to put him on here with you with me. Um, why don't we start with a little bit of a more detailed introduction to to you and ATBS for viewers who might not be familiar with uh, what all that you get, what it all it is that you guys do. You betcha, Todd. Thanks for having me on uh, this afternoon. And uh, I don't know what more you could ask for than to have two Todds on uh, Thursday talking about trucking, man. It's like the, the T's are lined up, right? So uh, uh, Overdrive, we've had a long track record of helping truck drivers understand their business better together uh, through the Partners in Business program. So we really enjoyed doing it. And at ATBS, we've been in business for over 20 years. And uh, you know, what we specialize in is just helping independent contractors make more money and pay less in taxes at the end of the day. So we do the books and taxes for about 20,000 independent contractors. They are in every kind of business you can imagine from gravel hauling to drive van and reefer and flatbed and specialized and port and drayage and all those kinds of things. And so the funnest part of what we do is because we have millions and millions of accounting transactions, we can take that data and kind of lump it all together and make those businesses all look very similar because they're all in the trucking business. And um, so we can produce some really incredible benchmark information that helps our clients and the stuff we're going to share today, just kind of see how they're doing against the average and the people that do real well and the people that don't do so well. And at the end of the day, you know, if you know your numbers, it's been proven time and time again, if you pay attention and manage your business, you do better than the average. Those that pay attention to their numbers and manage the business rather than just get in the truck and drive, um, they always make more money. So really look forward to sharing some of this information with uh with your audience today. Yeah, sounds great, Todd. And, uh, you know, before we dive into it, give us a little context for, you know, the owner operators listening in on kind of how to look at this, uh, if you could. I, I do feel like sometimes there's this uh, sort of can't see the forest for the trees sense that folks get when they get this big dump of data as detailed as this. Um, I certainly do sometimes myself. Um, and, you know, I do tend to feel like maybe for individual owners, it might be best to focus not exactly on the numbers themselves in every case, but the, the short and kind of long term trends, the ups and downs and whether the business is kind of tracking with those changes or not. Sure. I mean, you you hit on it pretty good, but just to kind of give you a preview, um, I like to talk about the big macro picture of what's going on in the economy and trucking. And we'll do that. And that'll help us think a little bit about what's the end of this year and into next year. What can we expect? Um, we are going to look at numbers from revenue to expenses to net income and all the things that are made up in those pay per mile, fuel cost per mile. So a lot of details and averages for just this year. But then we're also going to look at trends. So what has happened for the last 15 to 20 years so we can see what trends are. You know, so if I'm listening to this 
really what I want to do is take away a couple of things. I want to think about my business and how am I doing compared to others? Um, what can I expect going forward? And what should I be prepared for, you know, in the next six to 12 months? And uh, really, ultimately, um, how can I do better in my business? So I think, uh, I think those are the main things people can take away from it today. And, you know, of course, we're in the tax business. So uh, I'm sure we'll talk about a few tax things as well. Sounds great. And uh, why don't you uh, go ahead and jump right into the presentation. You can share your screen there. Sounds good, Todd. And uh, just make sure hopefully everybody can see the uh, yeah. presentation now and uh, we'll just start rolling through it. And uh, I have a tendency to talk really quick about a lot of information. So uh, like Todd said, feel free to ask questions at the end if, uh, if we get too far and um, we left you behind on something. So like I talked about at the very beginning, I like to kind of think about the big picture and uh, what is the economic environment and like in trucking. And sometimes this is a hard question to answer, but right now um, there's no question. It's the best trucking environment we've ever had. Uh, it's incredible. People are making crazy money. Uh, there's high paying loads. There's more loads than we can handle. You know, so we like to always kind of pay attention to different, metrics. They're really kind of outside of our control. Um, just to, you know, we're so overwhelmed with data these days. You got everything from what's going on with interest rates and, you know, what's the housing market doing and what are, I don't know, what's the employment number? And we can get caught up in all this data. And uh, for me, I like to look at very trucking specific things. And so there's, there's a few charts I've come to rely on. This is one of them. And you can get some information from DAT, but this happens to be from truckstop.com. And so the way we look at this is, um, I think in break evens, you know, when are things good for me and when are things not good for me? Um, above a break even line, they're good for me. Below a break even line, they're bad for me. So what this shows is about a, oh gosh, almost 10 year chart of the internet truck stop market demand index. And the market demand index is simply defined as for truckstop.com, how many loads are posted to the internet on a daily basis versus how many trucks are looking for load on the daily basis, supply and demand. Typically, if we go back 10 years ago, that ratio, if it was above seven, uh, it was a good ratio for truckers. If it was below seven, it was bad for truckers. We went through the kind of the boom cycle where you see that $2.55 a mile back in 2018. It was kind of a quick hit. Things were good for truckers after the ELD got implemented and, and then we sunk back down in 2019. But um, for some reason, the benchmark changed and we moved up to about a 32 break even back in those days, uh, meaning for every 32 loads posted, if there was one truck looking for a load, we were at a break even. If there's 50 loads available, then things are in favor of the trucker. So then you can see, you know, when we hit just after coronavirus, kind of summer of last year, mid 2020, this index just spiked and it went crazy. And we literally have been over 200 loads for every one truck looking for a load. What a robust market. You know, so in some ways, we know it's a robust market, but in, in other ways, that doesn't make sense. Like, that's crazy. There can't possibly be 200 loads for every truck looking for a load. And what happens in times like now in a spot market is when loads aren't getting moved, there's a lot of brokers in our business, right? And everybody's shippers are desperate to move loads. So those loads will get multiple posted multiple times. So you may have the same load out there four or five or six times. So there gets to be a little bit of noise in this. What we do know though, is that it's been high, it's stayed high. It's on its way back down. It's below 150 right now. So it's below 200, but it's by no means back down where it's been for you know a long time. My guess is the break even number is gonna move up. Uh, when we finally level off, maybe somewhere around 75, but we're still, you know, dang near double that. So it tells us we're still in a really super robust market in the spot market, which is great. We'll talk about kind of the um, contract market a little bit as we go through this, but the spot market is where a lot of independent contractors live. They haul on load boards. So um, the next thing that I like to look at is a, is a little bit more contracts. So the cash freight index, and you know, you can Google any of these and you can find this information online. Again, if I'm a trucker and I'm living in a robust market, the more information, the better. So pay attention to these things when you can. Um, and look at this kind of data. So the cash freight index has been around for a long time. This shows data all the way back to 2010. And what this shows is the number of shipments. And so you can kind of see again, back in 2018, we were at the highest we'd been in eight or nine years. And then we had coronavirus hit in early 2020 and we took a huge dip 
and we quickly came out of that. But what's really interesting about this chart to me is it's the number of shipments. And I should have better explained the cash freight index is a factoring, not factoring, it's a freight payment company for large shippers. So, you know, maybe think of the Costco's and the Walmarts of the world. They pay over $30 billion of freight bills a year from shippers to motor carriers. So it tracks a lot of data. So the number of shipments that went through there, you know, during the past six months is very similar to 2018. So what that tells me is we're in a good economy. We're in a 2018 economy, but we're not in an insane economy. So we'll talk a little bit as we go on. Why is trucking so good right now? Shipments are good. There's no doubt, but they're not extraordinary. They're not like out of sight crazy. Um, but when we look at the next slide, this tracks the money paid to move those shipments. And so we see a similar trend, right? Spike in 2018, fall in 2019, and then a plummet at the first half of 2020. We quickly come out of that. And now we're at record highs. So what this tells us is shippers are moving, paying a lot more money to move freight, even though we have a similar amount of freight to 2018. So Again, I'm not really telling you anything you don't know anecdotally and the freight that you're hauling, other than these are good trends to watch because when they start reversing themselves and when this rate starts coming down and when shipments start coming down and the truckstop.com index peaks and starts coming down, it's a time I might want to think about adjusting my business model. What am I doing? The spot market rates are going to start coming down. Do I need to start looking for longer term freight relationships and things like that? So that's the big picture. It's as good as it's ever been. I love it. And uh, let's just hope it at last. Man, as long as we can. We're already 18 months into this cycle. And, uh, you know, by all accounts, really going back to the early 2020s, a traditional trucking cycle will be somewhere between 12 to 24 months of good for the truckers. And then it'll be three to four years of bad for the truckers. So it's like quick up and then kind of a slow, gradual decrease if you think about it, rate and freight cycles. So, you know, by all accounts, we're already most of the way into a really good freight cycle and, and it should turn. Um, but I'm going to tell you some stuff as we go through. Most people are saying they think this could last all the way through 2022, which would be amazing. It would be a 30 month plus, almost going on three years, positive freight cycle for truckers, which which is incredible. So we get to share this data a lot with a lot of different people in a lot of different places, and um, we do a webinar. We we beyond the 20,000 independent truckers we work with, we work with about 200 motor carriers that we partner with to work with their independent truckers. Um, you can think of all the large fleets that run independent contractors. Um, we work with their drivers, but we also work with those fleets. So we do webinar with this kind of data um, typically twice a year. And we did one just about a month ago. And it's a chance to ask really a sentiment poll of these folks. How do you feel about um, things that are going on? So we asked them a few questions. So one of the questions we asked is, how do you, do you plan to add your IC fleet this year? And this only shows the question through the first quarter of 2021. Um, I don't have it updated for what we did just a month ago, but I can tell you people, fleets want to add capacity. Things are great. They're making money. Um, they want more trucks. They just are having a hard time finding them. We'll talk about why, uh, but, but people really want to add capacity in trucking right now. No surprise because things are good. So we're going to move in now and talk about the data um, a bit that ATBS produces based on all of our drivers. For me, it's important to kind of define what a driver is doing because we used to all just think of owner operators as owner operators, but really they do very different things and their business model changes depending on what they do. So at ATBS, we think of them in pioneer terms. A pioneer is a driver that uh, leases a truck from a motor carrier and also operates for that motor carrier. So you can think of it as that kind of traditional lease purchase, newer driver, um, just kind of learning the business. Um, once they've done that for a while, a lot of those drivers go out and they buy their own truck. They put money down, they finance it through an outside source, but they're still most comfortable operating under that motor carrier authority because of the things that they get out of that. The carrier, you know, booking the loads and collecting the money and taking care of their IFTA and all those kinds of things. Um, so about two thirds of the market operates in that segment for motor carriers. Then we have the Lone Ranger and that's a driver that's out there doing it on their own. They got their own authority. They're running their own business. Um, they got their own truck. And then the trailblazer is ultimately kind of that career path where someone's gone out and it's happening a lot right now. You know, I've been successful for the last couple of years. I made good money. I buy my second, third, fourth truck. I get my cousin, my brother, my uncle to drive for me, but my best friend. And next thing you know, I, I own five or 10 trucks and, and I'm a small fleet. And those people are growing like crazy right now because it's a robust market. So I'll talk about those different segments a bit as we go through the data, but just so you kind of have that foundation. So I kind of hit on this a little bit already, but just to give you a big picture of, you know, the market you're in, um, there's an estimated around 3 million truck drivers in the U.S. 
about 10% of them are independent contractors. So you could say there's about 300,000 independent contractors. Again, about probably 180 to 200,000 of those operate for motor carriers. About 100,000 of them are out there doing it on their own under their own authority. Um, you know, so we talked about the great trucking economy and what typically happens in a great trucking economy is truckers get excited. They go buy more trucks, they buy new trucks, they buy used trucks, they hire drivers and we get too many trucks in the business and all of a sudden we got more trucks and we have loads and after 18 months, things get bad for truckers again. So the question is, why isn't that happening right now? And there's a few reasons, but one of the biggest reasons, we've heard of driver shortage. I've been around trucking for, I'm 55. So I've been around trucking for 55 years, but I paid attention to it for at least 35 years. We've always had a driver shortage. The driver shortage has always been talked about, but it's extraordinary right now. And there's a few reasons that people talk about. One is the drug and alcohol clearing house that got implemented last year, you know, wiped out a significant amount of drivers um, that used to kind of skate through the system. Um, truck driving schools were shut down last year because of COVID and way lower capacity. So we just stopped the pipeline of drivers coming in. Um, it's not a secret that the truck driving population is aging. Some folks are retiring. They made okay money. They got stimulus money and they just don't want to drive anymore, especially with COVID. Um, COVID kept people home. Uh, we have a booming economy, which means there's a lot of jobs out there. Maybe I don't want to drive a truck. Maybe I want to do something else, be construction, whatever else. Um, and there's a lot of people that just simply don't want to drive a truck anymore. So for all those reasons, uh, it's been really difficult to fill the pipeline of drivers. And as challenging as that is for the trucking industry, it's a good thing for all of us that are in it because it keeps a lid on capacity. Um, I'll talk more about trucks in a minute, but at the same time as that, we literally can't get more trucks in this industry because you all will hear about the supply chain issues, everything from chips to parts to, you know, we just can't manufacture trucks. Used trucks are costing twice what they used to cost. So it's not just drivers, it's also trucks which is frustrating as an industry, but at the end of the day, it's an equalizing thing among all of us. And we can't add a lot more capacity like we traditionally have done. At the end of the day, that's a great thing because it's keeping capacity at a certain level while we have a high amount of loads. And that's what's kept rates as high as they are for as long as they have. And what you know foreseeably is gonna keep that happening all the way through 2022. So it's a good thing. So as I talk through our data, um, you know, I'll get to it in, in just a minute, but I just a few things to understand. So 20,000 drivers, you know, in all kinds of different segments of the industry, we break them, them down into dry, reefer, flatbed, and specialized. And those are all operating for motor carriers. We also break them down into independents, meaning you're that Lone Ranger out there doing this on your own. Um, we wipe out the top 10% and the bottom 10%. Um, just because there's noise, if somebody started partway through a month or a quarter, we don't want those low producers you know, polluting the, the bottom. On the top end, if someone's a team hauler or they're hauling munitions and they're making a half million bucks a year, um, we really want to kind of focus on the 80% of the middle. So just so you kind of understand the data, that's what we do. And we've done it, you know, for 20 years this way. So the good news is the data is very consistent. Um, you can kind of see in there, I'm going to share with you some uh, data as we look at those different segments of the industry. Uh, we have 135 total carriers. Again, those are big motor carriers that have owner operators running for them. So um, 41 in the dry van, 26 in the reefer, 20 in the flatbed, and 48 in the specialized. So when we look at that specific data, then that you know that's what we're looking at. So we'll start off and looking at kind of what makes up revenue. We'll look at miles. The average owner operator's miles are down. And so what we're looking at is the first half of this year, the last half of last year. So really trailing 12 months um, versus the 12 months before that to kind of see what the trend is. So the black bars are 2021, the gold bars are 2020. So we're down year over year by one and a half percent, about 1500 miles. The average driver is running right at 101,000 miles right now. So again, we're going to give you a ton of numbers and hopefully just some stuff that you can say, hey, you know, gosh, I run 120,000 miles. I'm doing great. Or I run 100 or I run 80,000 miles. I don't run a lot of miles. Um, a lot of that depends on how much you get paid per mile. Right. And we'll talk about that in the bottom over here on the right. You can see the independent dry reefer. Um, and flat segments, and you can see independents and flatbed guys run a lot less because they typically haul at a higher rate per mile. They have higher deadhead rates and those kinds of things. Dry and reefer tend to run more miles. So uh, I talked about we're going to look at some long-term trends, and, and I love doing this in certain areas, and especially miles. It still blows my mind when I think back to the early 2000s when we got in business. 
the average owner operator, the way you made money was you got in your truck, you shut your door, you put the pedal to the metal and you just hauled ass for five weeks. And that's all you could do. Um, you made, you know, a buck, 10 a mile. And it was just all about running miles. Our average driver, you know, 15 years ago was running 139,000 miles a year, which is crazy to think about with ELDs. Um, we now know that's illegal. I can't physically log that. And so I'd be, you know, getting pulled out of my truck and uh, getting all kinds of tickets. But that's the way the business was. Over a period of time, um, things have happened. The industry's changed. Um, we had hours of service rules change. Um, we've had regionalization of freight. We've had electronic logging mandates, a lot of different things. What's always interesting on this chart to me is to see that we run less miles when things are good. It's kind of counterintuitive in a time like now. I just showed you we're down 100 and we're down one and a half percent or about 1500 miles. In my business, when things are really good, I work my butt off. I get on a plane, I travel, I go try and get new customers um, because I don't always have that opportunity. It's crazy in trucking. It's the opposite. When rates are high, drivers get choosy on loads. I get that. Why would you not be? If there's more loads than you can all take the best pay in one. Um, but also when you make more money, you work hard. You work 70 hours a week, you know, by law, you can do that. And so you want more time off. You want weekends off. You want time with your family. You want to relax. And so drivers do that. If they start making more net income, you know, they don't necessarily want a bunch more money in the bank. What they want is a better quality of life. So we always see less miles when things are good. Contrary to that, when things are challenging and rates come down and I'm not making as much money and I can't pay the bills, I got to go run miles. And so miles go up. So again, just interesting to look at trends. We're definitely in one of those trends right now where people are running less miles, which again is a good thing from an industry perspective, because if every truck out there, three and a half million trucks or three million trucks are running 1500 miles less um, per year, that's a lot of miles that have been taken off the road that shippers aren't all in freight, which again is what keeps rates high. So just trying to give you a, a big picture perspective of what's going on in the business. So revenue per mile, um, great news. It's up seven cents a mile year over year. The average is a buck 55. Again, you can see in the bottom right, those independent guys are doing a buck 75 on average. This is all miles, everything included, all pay, um, fuel surcharge, unloading, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you can see the different rate for dry reef and flat. So one thing that's important to keep in mind, especially right now, um, we're going to talk a little bit about fuel surcharge, but you can see the top of this chart. We have the DOE national average. So the gold bar again is 2020. The black bar is 2021. And you can see they almost reversed each other. Fuel costs came down at the beginning of coronavirus because nobody was out there driving. So there was no, no demand. So fuel costs came way down. And then people started driving again and they came way back up and they're still spiking today because people are on the road, you know, cars and trucks. So fuel's going way up. So one thing we got to keep in mind with this information is what's happening with fuel. Is the rate increase simply because of fuel surcharge because fuel's going up or is it a true rate increase? And we'll tie that out um, when we get a few more slides down the road. I can tell you that that seven cents per mile um, is all rate increase. It has nothing to do with fuel because if you tie out that top, the golden black bar, even though they kind of cross each other year over year, it was almost a break even um, the fuel costs, even though they were different early and late in the year. So a slide for me that is really interesting to pay attention to and look at is you know the psychology of the market and you as drivers. Uh, do I want to drive for a fleet and be leased onto a fleet or I, do I want to do this for myself? Um, we're big on break even. So again, I got a break even up here. Right now we've got the break even at about 48 cents a mile. That's that red line. It jumped up from a few years ago from you know just over 40 cents a mile because insurance costs have gone crazy. If I'm going to go out and get my own authority and do this for myself, I got to have auto liability insurance. And that auto liability went from costing six or $7,000 to $20,000 a year. So um, it's more expensive for me to go do this on my own. So at that break even, really what it says is, if I'm running for a fleet, I'm gonna just say at a buck 50 per mile, I've gotta make over two bucks a mile for me to go do this on my own. Cause I gotta do a bunch of stuff to do this on my own. I gotta get my own trailer. I gotta book my own loads. I gotta collect my loads. I'm gonna have some not as operational efficient cause I have one trailer instead of dropping hooks. Do I like I do with a fleet? I got to get all my own license and permits. So it's got to pay me to do that, right? Otherwise, why would I? So you can see when you look at the far right, you know, 2018, we we're above the break even. You look at 2020 and 2021, we're well above that break even, which is why there's been a migration of a lot of drivers who have gone from even company driver, go out and get my own truck and run this market because um, I can make a ton of money doing it. So, you know, we wanted to look just 
beyond that long-term picture into just the COVID era. And you can see as soon as we got out of COVID and everybody being terrified and freaked out and freight started moving, you know, the back half of last year, we've been above that break even. We've been over a dollar differential, which means again, if I can run at a fleet for a buck fifty, I can run, you know, the spot market for two, two fifty. Um, so let's see what that means in, you know, actual literal dollars and the difference. I'm gonna just flip to the next slide and look at the COVID era. You know, today I can literally I can run contracted to that fleet long term for you know around a buck fifty to a buck fifty five, or I can go out and make two fifty in the spot market. Um, but it cost me fifty grand to go do that. So if I put that in real numbers in the spot market, I'm going to do two hundred and fifty grand in revenue. It's going to cost me an extra fifty to do that. So I'm going to net one hundred thousand dollars. If I'm running for a fleet, I'm going to net a, I'm going to do one hundred and fifty thousand in revenue. And um, I'm going to make about $70,000 a year. So, you know, I can make close to $50,000 a year running that spot market. One thing I want to just remind you, though, is looking at this long-term trend, you know, these times last about 12 to 18 months, typically. We're in a longer cycle right now. We're at least halfway through it. Um, so maybe this one's going to last three years. But then I got three to four years where it doesn't pay me to be out there. So, you know, what I'm thinking about right now, if I'm you, is, okay, I'm halfway through this cycle. I'm killing it. I'm making a ton of money in the spot market. But what happens is when freight dries up, when there gets to be too many trucks, um, the spot market goes to crap, right? And it may pay me less than I can make running for that fleet. I've gone out and I borrowed money against my home on a second mortgage or, you know, I've leveraged things to get my trailer and pay for my insurance. I got to pay for it all up in front. So how am I going to do that when the market turns? So now's the time, maybe you don't have to go do this today, but you want to start thinking about this. How am I going to tie up some longer term, good paying freight, not great paying freight because the spot market is great paying right now. It's going to go at some point to being bad paying freight. So, so how can I think about this longer term? Can I get some shipper contracts? Or maybe it makes sense for me to start looking at a carrier that I want to lease on to in the next six to 12 months when the market dries up because the carriers have those three to five year contracts at that you know consistent rate. They don't play this crazy up and down market like the spot market. So um, I just say that simply because I've seen so many people that flock to the spot market in a market like this, they kill it for a year and then they're broke. They lose everything they had because they weren't prepared for the downturn. So think about what happens when the downturn comes, save money so you can get through the downturn to the next up cycle. Enough said, I don't want to lecture you. I just want to you know, tell you what we've learned. So you know, what does this do to a market like this? I love this slide because it really paints a picture of why we've been relatively stagnant on growing trucks. Um, the large motor carriers, number one, they found discipline. They've found in the past where they've gone out and bought a bunch of trucks and added drivers, it pollutes the market and it brings the rates down. So number one, they've been disciplined. Number two, they just can't find drivers for all the reasons that I mentioned. So that red line is those big fleets, 5,000 trucks or more. Um, they have not been able to grow during the last 18 months. They haven't added any capacity yet. Those one truck drivers, that blue line, there's been over 60,000 trucks under federal motor carrier safety registrations that have got their own authority. Um, so you see that owner operator population growing significantly. We've seen that at our business. We've added thousands of clients over the last 18 months that have become owner operators. Um, so kind of interesting. I think in the past, you would have seen that red line go up on parallel with the blue line. And that's why we over truck so quickly and things get bad. Um, so it's good really to kind of see that flatness. Gross revenues. So um, the average owner operator is doing one hundred and fifty six thousand dollars in revenue. That's up almost three percent, you know, year over year. You can see in the bottom right. It's always interesting to me because you remember the difference in pay per mile and miles run by those segments. But the gross revenue gets really close. We're between one fifty five and one sixty five, pretty much on gross revenue. At the end of the day, all of you need to make a certain amount of money to pay your bills, pay your truck, and make money, right? So no matter what segment you're in you wind up getting pretty close from a gross revenue perspective. Um, so I'm going to just flip through some charts real quick just to give you some number and some benchmarks. Fuel surcharge, whether you're in the market, you know, sometimes you just get gross revenue. You don't know how much is in there for fuel. But if you run for a motor carrier, if they're paying a fuel surcharge, you know, a range in the drive-in business right now is somewhere between 12% to 20% of the revenue should be in fuel surcharge. That's what, you know, three and a quarter fuel gets you is about somewhere around that 17, 18% fuel surcharge. In the reefer business, not a ton different. Um, so, you know, that's the revenue side, miles, revenue per mile and total revenue. Let's, you know, switch and talk about the cost side of the business. And, you know, we're not going to talk about every cost, but really just kind of the big ones. So we'll start 
your biggest cost, fuel. Um, I already talked about it a little bit, you know, fuel costs went down and then they went up and they're still climbing today. Um, the good news is year over year, when we look at this from June backwards, they're pretty much flat. They were down actually two cents per mile, about 39 cents a mile was what the average owner operator was spending on fuel. And we're gonna talk a lot about fuel over these next few slides. So again, just to give you some numbers as a percentage of revenue, what do I spend on fuel? Right in the middle is around 27.4%. If I'm doing really good, I'm spending 20% of my revenue on fuel. If I'm on the high end, I'm spending 32% of my revenue on fuel. If I'm in the dry van business, if I'm in the reefer business, it's gonna trend a little bit higher because they're pulling heavier loads typically. So on the high end, 33% of my revenue, um, I'm spending on fuel. If I'm in the flatbed business, non-aerodynamic, typically ever heavier, same thing. I'm going to spend a couple percent higher on my fuel. Um, specialized, you know, that can be crazy business, right? I can have double drop deck, really heavy, um, or I can have, you know, I, these could also be people that are expediters that are running those little, you know, um, van trucks that are, you know, getting paid 10 bucks a mile to haul uh, munitions across the country. So they might be, you know, spending only, you know, 15% of the revenue on fuel. Again, just to give you some ideas, uh, if you track your miles and you want to like it on a, a cost per mile basis instead of a percent of revenue, you know, somewhere around 44 cents a mile is pretty good, uh, right in the middle for fuel costs um, for the second quarter of this year. Um, I'm going to flip through these just uh, just for the sake of time. So, again, looking at the big long picture, um, you know, we've gone over uh, the time we've tracked this data over 15 years from drivers getting five and a half miles per gallon to the average driver getting over seven miles per gallon today, which is awesome. They're more fuel efficient trucks, um, even though they cost a lot more, uh, they do better for fuel economy. Um, we've slowed down, you know, those days when drivers used to run 100, 139,000 miles a year. Um, we didn't pay attention to the speed limit. A lot of times drive trucks are running 85 miles an hour unsafe. So um, one thing that's really interesting when you look at the far right of this slide, uh, we thought the data was screwed up last year when we hit coronavirus because we saw this huge spike in fuel economy, a mile per gallon. And you can see that over there. And then we see it dropping off again this year. What we realized halfway through last year was, as drivers told us, it was, as we talked to them about it, it was the most efficient transportation network we've ever had. Um, to say that means that everybody stayed home. I didn't have all these cars and SUVs and people on the highway causing traffic jams in Denver and Atlanta and LA and all these crazy cities. I could just get out and drive. I didn't have to sit in traffic for four hours in a major city. I didn't have to get out and pass people on two lane roads. Trucks were the only ones out there. You know, this time last year, they were the only ones driving because everybody else was afraid and stayed home. That meant you had incredible fuel efficiency because um, you could run your truck like it was supposed to be run. You weren't idling and you weren't doing a bunch of that uh, stuff. So, you know, we're talking about spending money on a highway infrastructure bill. And, and I hope they get some money put aside for that because the more efficient we can make the highway system for you guys, the more you can travel free of all those burdens of traffic and, you know, people slowing you down. Obviously, it's a better quality of life for you, but it saves money on fuel too. So again, some numbers by segment. Um, independents are getting around six and a half miles per gallon. Dry van business, we get over seven, seven and a quarter miles per gallon. Reefer, because we're heavier, we're getting six and a half miles per gallon. Flatbed, you know, we're getting down around six, six and a quarter miles per gallon. Again, just some numbers to benchmark yourself against and see how you're doing. So for me, this is a really important slide that helps me understand when fuel's moving higher or lower. Um, how are we doing in the revenue piece? We can see that revenue was up seven cents a mile. Fuel was down two cents a mile. Net net, that means we're nine cents better this year. You can see on the far right bottom, um, that's about a $6,600 gain in revenue and fuel cost reduction. And we'll see that when we look at the bottom line. So those are good. So one thing you guys know, but I just want to kind of reiterate in your mind, last year, from a fuel perspective, when we're in a falling fuel market, it's a good thing from a cash flow perspective because fuel surcharges adjust weekly, sometimes even monthly, which adjusts my revenue. So my revenue is adjusting down slower than I adjust almost every day at the pump. When fuel prices are going down and diesel fuel is going down, it adjusts every day at the pump. So you kind of have a cash flow gain because you're making more on the revenue than your fuel costs. Once they level out and they come back up, the reverse happens. And we're experiencing that right now. Fuel costs are going up you know, fairly drastically. They have been for dang near a year now. And they adjust every day at the pump, right? They're not waiting to increase the price. They're going up every day. Whereas my revenue, my fuel surcharge is adjusting on a slower basis to offset that weekly or monthly. So I'm kind of in a cash flow crunch. 
we don't necessarily feel that terribly right now because we're in such a good market and rates are good. But just remember that as fuel goes up and down, you got to be have cash to be prepared for that. Um, so a poll question we asked is just really the sentiment of what's going on with um, the IC model, right? We hear about AB5, we hear about the PRO Act, we hear about the governments against owner operators are going to outlaw them and all these things. So we want to get the sentiment of the fleets. How do you feel? Are you going to keep contracting with independent contractors? You can see kind of back through the Trump era, you know, the fear really went away. Things were good. Um, people were very optimistic on the owner operator model. We got the new administration. This is not a political statement at all. Um, I'm just saying when when the House went Democrat, the Senate went Democrat and Biden got elected, everybody gets afraid, right? They want to enact laws that say you should be an employee of a company um, because we can't unionize you if you're an independent contractor. So, um, you know, we all are on our on our toes, paying attention to what's going on with legislation. At the end of the day, you know, I'll talk about it on my last slide. I don't believe you can outlaw the American dream, which is what being an independent contractor is. You own your own business. You're out there making your way in the world, you know, fighting for everything that you make. And no matter how strong the government thinks they are, they can't outlaw that dream for you, um, but they can make it difficult. And so we need to band together and, and of course, fight against that. So truck payments, again, long-term trend. Uh, gosh, our average client used to pay $1,700 a month for a truck 15 years ago. Today, they're playing, paying close to $2,500 a month for a truck. Um, prices have gone up. In the last year, the price of used trucks has doubled. You used to buy a year ago, a good truck, 35, 40 grand with 500,000 miles. You're going to pay 85 grand for that truck today. It's a crazy market we're in. Um, so I don't expect this trend to reverse. A big reason for the increase is all the CPA emission requirements that get thrown on truck manufacturers. It costs money to put all these electronics on these trucks, do the R&D, costs a lot more in maintenance, makes things more expensive. You know, fortunately we've regained some of this in fuel efficiency, which is good. So I'm gonna talk about maintenance for a little bit because that's something that jumped up on our radar in the last year. Maintenance has been a butt kicker. Um, cost has gone up a lot. When, you know, this has been going on for 20 years. And as we do research and talk with partners in business in Overdrive Magazine, the top three reasons owner operators fail, number one is maintenance. And, you know, so that sounds kind of crazy. Why would I fail because of maintenance? But what typically happens is you have a catastrophic event, you got an engine that goes out or you hit something in the road and you knock out, you know, eight tires, eight drive tires, and it's going to cost you seven or eight grand. Um, so, Really, I guess my point is going to be with these next few slides, maintenance costs have gone up and they're going up. And so you need to be prepared for that. You need to set money aside for it because what puts people out of business is they don't have money set aside. They can't get a loan. And so they just can't afford to fix their truck and it gets repoed and, you know, they got to go collect unemployment or be a company driver or whatever it is. Number two and number three are simply, you know, health. Uh, people get sick. They don't have health insurance. Um, and they go out of business. And number three is they don't pay their taxes and the IRS catches up with them. Um, so let's talk about maintenance a little bit. It's up 10%. That's a big number. $1,000 in the last year to $11,600. Um, if we look at the long-term trend, maintenance you know, has gone up over time from $0.08 cents a mile to almost $0.11 cents a mile on average today. I'm going to give you some numbers in a few slides about based on how old your truck is, what we think you should set aside to reserve for maintenance. Um, but look at that spike in the last 12, 14 months. It's significant. Why is that spike significant? You know, we're living in a world where we have inflation, no matter if the government or the news media want to admit it or not. We live in a high inflation world right now. Um, labor rates have gone up drastically. Just like our industry can't find truck drivers, we can't find people to fix these trucks. So labor rates are up to 190 bucks an hour. Um, all the parts, you know, the rubber, the fluids, everything is costing more money. And really, at the end of the day, what you may not think about is what used to take me, you know, a day repair, going to the shop, get it fixed. Um, I'm back on the road again today. It might take you a week because they don't have the part. They're backed up. They got more trucks in the shop. And so the unfortunate part of that is it causes you downtime and you're going to lose a lot more in downtime and the opportunity cost of not being able to be out there making money. So really the thing that you can take away, I guess, number one is I'll give you numbers, what you should set aside for maintenance, but do preventive maintenance, try and get those things taken care of before they're catastrophic, before they cause you, you know, major downtime and major delays. So in today's world, um, you know, we feel like that brand new truck, we used to say set aside two or three cents because it's under warranty and you just got to pay for rubber and PMs. Um, today, that brand new truck, you should be setting aside five cents a mile. Those things have gone up rubber and PMs. 
Um, plus, some things aren't covered under warranty. If I got that older truck, if I've got that four or five or even years older truck, I need to be setting aside 11, 12 cents a mile. If I got a you know million mile plus truck, I need to be setting aside 15 to 20 cents a mile. Um, maintenance costs have gone up a lot. And uh, I'm just saying, this will put you out of business if you haven't set the money aside to take care of that when, when the issue comes up. Um, so I love this slide for a reason because you can make the argument in our industry, I'm going to run an old truck. I don't want to have any truck payments and I'll just pay what it costs in maintenance. Or I'm going to buy a brand new truck, have 100% warranty because I don't want to deal with maintenance and downtime. So what this slide does is take truck payment plus maintenance costs and divides it by number of miles run. So it kind of is the great neutralizer where they have a new truck, no truck payment, maintenance, you know, put that all together. And you can see in here for the drive van business, Around 37 cents a mile is a good number. That's what I should be spending for my truck payment and my maintenance. Um, so again, just to give you a benchmark of where you should be. Um, reefer business is a little bit more expensive. You typically find maybe a little higher price truck, maybe a little more horsepower because they're pulling more weight. Um, flatbed similar and specialized, you find higher, you know, higher truck costs. Um, if you have to have OCAC, especially if you're running under a fleet, just to give you some numbers, an average is around $130 a month for OCAC expense. License and permits, you know, we find around $175 a month on average. Communications, my cell phone bill, if I got to communicate with a fleet, you know, somewhere, <clears throat> excuse me, around $100 to $150 a month. So we get to the big important number, um, net income. And I'm just so happy to see this number because it's the first time since we've tracked this data that our average driver, not our good drivers, our average driver is making over $70,000 a year. You know, I remember just a few years ago when that was in the low 60s and even below 60, up 10% over the last year. Great news. Again, you can see in the bottom right, independents are making 70, drive vans making 70, reefers making less, 64 grand, and flatbed guys are making 80,000. You know, so good net income numbers. I love seeing the increase. We're going to have more of it this year. Net income is going to keep going up for sure through the end of this year. So one thing that I love to look at is kind of what I call the proposition for my business. What's the payback? Um, how hard am I going to have to work for how much money I'm going to make? And if we look at the long-term trend, you know, this is what I point out to anybody that tells me the owner-operator model is going away. These guys can't make money. It's a terrible living. You know, that's why it needs to be outlawed and they need to all, need to all be company drivers somewhere where we can, you know, look out for them because they're being abused. When we look at these numbers, what it tells us is over the last 17, 18 years, we've gone from driving 139,000 miles to 101,000 miles. So that's a 35% reduction in the miles we're driving. I'm not saying you guys don't work hard, but I'm saying it's a better quality of life than it was 15 years ago. It's more regional. I get home more often. So things are better. At the same time, I've gone from making $47,000 a year net income to 70,000. That's a 50% increase in pay. So, you know, really at the end of the day, the economics are better and the work is better. And, you know, by supply and demand, right? You guys wouldn't do this if you didn't enjoy it and you weren't making decent money. Um, so I like to point out those trends. Uh, net income, just to give you some ranges, uh, in the drive van business, on the high end, we're making six figures over 100 grand. On the low end, you know, 50 grand. We already talked about the average around 70. In the uh, reefer business, you know, the low end, pretty similar. Um, I'm under 100 grand if I'm on the high end, but not too far from it. In the flatbed business, you know, gosh, over 125,000 on the high end, uh, 60 grand on the low end. And the specialized business, you know, over six figures for sure if I'm on the high end. I'll tell you, our top 10% of our drivers from a net income perspective, they net over $250,000 a year. Um, it's a crazy time to be in this business and it's a good time to make money. Um, Long-term trend of net income per mile and just dollar basis, again, you know, it's a good picture long-term. We have our ups and our downs and for sure it's painful sometimes, but long-term it looks pretty good. So this is my last slide. And, and really, you know, what I want to reiterate is drivers are doing well. It's a good economy. And uh, I'll tell anybody that, um, you know, I truly believe no matter what the government thinks, no matter what they says, say, look at California. It's the most perfect example there is. They started harassing the owner-operator model 15 years ago. They started telling you that hauling out of the port, you had to have these brand new trucks. Um, they've since come out with AB5 and they're pretty much outlawing owner operators. What's happened? We've got like 80 ships sitting out in the ocean because we can't unload the trucks. We can't unload the ships because we have nothing to haul those, you know, 
those containers. So if we need a micro lesson in what happens if we outlaw owner operators nationwide, it's it. Our shelves are going to be empty. We're not going to have anything to wear, anything to eat. So, you know, I hope America, and I'm actually, I've seen this week, I've seen articles on this. I hope we're waking up to the fact that the government can screw with all the things that they want. But sooner or later, when you put the American dream out of business, we all suffer and pay for it. And I hope we all, you know, stand up and take note. And because uh, um, I love you guys, you work hard, you're the backbone of America. And uh, um, so it really pisses me off when people think that they can outlaw what you're doing. Before I stop sharing, I'll just put up our website and my phone number. Um, if you guys need any help with your business or if you want to talk to anything we talk to, feel free to, to give us a yell. We'd be happy to help you. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop the share, Todd, and I'm guessing we got a few questions and stuff that we want to talk about. Yeah, thanks, Todd. Um, definitely. Um, and well said there at the end. Uh, at, we actually, uh, you know, when, when you talk about the California example, uh, we've definitely been uh, following that as well and uh, had, a, had a long conversation with an East Coast intermodal uh, owner operator the other day that uh, he, he more or less said the, said the exact same thing. He used to live out in California, but um, he, he, he doesn't anymore. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a strange object lesson that, uh, that's happening out there, no doubt. Um, anybody, anybody who does have a question, like I said, uh, leave them in the chat on if you're watching on YouTube or in uh, the comment section if you're watching there at overdriveonline.com. Uh, first one that that I thought I'd put to you, uh, Todd, is you know it's like the you you addressed it a bit uh, during the talk, but uh, you know how it's the it's the million dollar question, I guess. How long is this uh, how long is this one going to last in terms of uh, the good environment that we're in with with rates um, continuing to pace uh, pretty pretty well uh, the growth in costs uh, because you, like you said things things are uh, it's definitely definitely a inflationary environment. Uh, costs are going up pretty fast. And just in the past few weeks, I mean, fuel is up, you know, 10, 10, 15 percent. Um, and, you know, for for a lot of the folks in the audience that are, you know, owner operators working at the spot market with brokers, they, they're they not uh, always, um, you know, it's, 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 it's sort of hard to evaluate whether uh, rates are, are keeping up with those increases because they're not they're not paid on a they're not paid a, uh, adjusting fuel surcharge. You know, how long, how long do we expect this to last? And you know, what do we need to be looking out for uh, in terms of the turn, I guess? Yeah, my thought, Todd, and I get this asked this question a lot. And the good news is I get to ask it a lot, too, because I'm lucky I get to talk to a lot of people. I can tell you, you know, CEOs, CFOs, top management groups, at everybody from J.B. Hunt to Swift to Knight to Landstar to Schneider, you know, and they have they have economists on staff to pay attention to stuff like this. And gosh, three or four months ago, I started hearing these companies say this is going to last to the end of 2022. And I was like, golly, that seems crazy to me. Why? How? I mean, psych truck cycles don't last that long. And when they start talking about the underlying factors, which we already touched on, we can't find drivers. Um, you know, a piece of it for a while has been the government stimulus. People are getting paid to stay home, $600 worth of unemployment you know, on a weekly basis, there were people making 50 grand a year. So that kept a lot of people out of the labor market that ended in September. So we're starting to see some of them come back, but we're still in a good economy. So I don't see us inventing and creating a bunch of drivers anytime soon. We're going to have a driver shortage. We're not going to manufacture a bunch of trucks, this chip shortage and the supply chain shortage. Um, those things are going to last for a while. So when all that gets cleared up, which it will, right, over time that gets cleared up, just because of what we've been going through, we also are low on inventory in America industry. Like we're at record lows on inventory. We need to restock shelves. And, and so people tell me there's like eight months worth of freight just simply to restock shelves when we get enough trucks to do so. And I think so people probably figure as getting back to maybe a normalized market end of the first quarter into the second quarter. And then we got to restock inventory and we have good shipping season in you know, third quarter of next year. So for all those reasons, I hear people say this is going to last at least until the end of 2022. I'm kind of a conservative, you know, cover the downside and the upside will take care of itself, guys. So I'm going to just milk this as long as I can. I'm going to put money in the bank, but I'm starting to be in tune. I'm paying attention to the things we've talked about. Um, we're in strong shipping season right now, right? It's the holiday season, so things are good. But when we start in January and February, which traditionally slows down a bit, if it's feeling slow, 
Um, it'll pick up as we get into the second and third quarter next year, but, but I might be thinking about making sure I've got things, you know, geared up. So that's the best answer I have for today, but, um, right. yeah, it's good. Right. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's interesting, you know, you, you look at the, you know, all the pressures on the, on the large fleets in terms of being able to track, uh, drivers in, in, in the current market. Uh, and, and we, we did a, we did an house where we looked at, we tried to, to find the best proxy for, for growth that we, that we could, uh, over the course of the pandemic period. And yeah, all the growth is really happening among the smaller companies like this, uh, under, under 100 fleets. And particularly, you know, like, like you showed in that chart, uh, the number of owner operators out there, people going out and getting their uh, own carrier authority. Um, so you know, yeah, it's, as long as those pressures remain, um, and, and the, the rates environment continues well and the freight and freight's good, uh, should be in good, in, in good news for, for the small entities. I agree. Okay. Um, another piece of good news. Um, I wanted to give you an opportunity to opportunity to explain this, uh, because I know it's a it's somewhat complicated, but it's the per diem changes uh, this year that will, stand to kind of lower the tax bill for for owner operators uh, in somewhat substantial way uh if if uh, if they can take advantage of it explain those to me i know there's a there's a there's a increase in the per diem that just went into effect in the fourth quarter of this year but there's also some other changes in the meals deduction that can apply as well yeah there's two things todd and i'm going to keep it as simple as i can because i've been on satellite radio i've been on webinars and and we could take five hours worth of per diem questions because it is a confusing subject. But the two things in simplest terms are the per diem rate, which is $66 per day for the first three quarters of this year was increased to $69 a day, October 1st for the fourth quarter. So make sure your accountant is deducting the extra $3 a day for the fourth quarter. That's the simple one. That happens about every three years. The more complex one is the government wanted, this goes all the way back to Trump. They wanted people to go back to restaurants during COVID. And so what they did was um, they increased the meal deductibility. You used to call it the, the businessman's three martini lunch. So you and me thought if we went out to lunch and we had some beers, um, we're cheating on our expense report typically. And so the IRS didn't like that. So they said, whatever you spend on meals and entertainment is only 50% deductible because you're screwing the IRS. So what the government said was, um, Donald Trump said, hey, these restaurants and businesses are hurting. We need to get people back there. So we are going to make that 100% deductible. You and me can go have five beers and cheeseburgers, and uh, we can now deduct 100%. That's awesome. Truck drivers have always been a little bit aside from that because as an industry, we've lobbied. We've said drivers have to be away from home. They can't eat cheaply at home like we do. They have to eat out because they're on the road. So we lobbied that deduction from 50% up to 80%. So the trouble is when they defined this law, when they changed it to go from 50 to 100%, they left truck drivers out of it, even though it's a special rule in the IRS law. So we actually went to the lady in charge of this at the IRS and uh, took a few conversations, but we said, what about truck drivers? You don't talk about them. Do they go to 100%? Do they stay at 80%? And, uh, you know, they were vague at first and they said, well, the way it's written, they're at 80%. We said, well, that's unfair. Um, the Wendy's at the truck stop needs people just like the, you know, PF Chang's or the Morton's Steakhouse needs people in the restaurant. And I said, yeah, you're right. The overall goal of the economic package was to incentivize people in the restaurants. So we want, we will give drivers 100% deduction. The trouble is, 100% deduction is on actual true meal receipts. They said, if your drivers are spending over $66 a day in restaurants, keep those receipts and they can deduct 100%. So it gets really complicated. We said, so per diem is set up so drivers don't have to keep track of all those meal receipts. They just get a flat 66 bucks a day without having to do that. So it got, it got really complicated and convoluted. And we said, so what about if we just have our drivers keep track of how, what percentage of their time they eat in a restaurant, what percentage of the time they're eating in the truck. And if it's 20% in the restaurant, then we can deduct 20% of that per diem at 100%. And the 80% they're in the truck will deduct at 80%. So I know I just confused the crap out of you because it's really confusing, but it literally is going to be a few thousand dollars. Um, we can deduct 100% for some of your per diem expense. And whoever you use for your tax services should be doing that. Um, they may take the lazy way out and they're likely going to take $66 a day all year for per diem deduction. 
I just bring it up to help you know. Um, it can save you a few thousand on taxes. So ask the question and do the research to save money on taxes. Right. And I mean, I, I guess the the other part of that is um, you know, being able to uh, prove that uh, you, you had you ate a certain percentage of your meals while you're out uh, at restaurants, right? It's a good point, Todd, because up to this point, we've always told our drivers, throw away your meal receipts. You don't need them because you get automatic 66 bucks a day, just moved to 69 bucks a day. But for this year, I would keep those meal receipts so that you have a valid proof. You know, I eat every breakfast uh, at a truck stop because I like my bacon and eggs. And then, you know, I don't eat my lunch and dinner. So I eat 30% of my meals in, in, uh, in a restaurant. Definitely keep those receipts so you got some backup. Right, right. Um, okay, got a question here from uh, from an audience member. Um, it's 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 pretty pretty simple, but you know, it's about it's about those outliers in the in the data that you were talking about, and um, and you know that that top ten percent versus may, versus maybe the bottom ten percent. You know, when you think about business business practices and and you know just bedrock basics, like what what separates those two? Like like what's the clear clear defining uh, thing that separates the you know the high earners from from or just from the average? I guess is is, is the I think the spirit of the question. Yeah, so you know the people I think of as the top ten percent are those that are in this to win it. They're business people. Um, they don't think of themselves as just a truck driver. They pay attention to their numbers. They do a budget. They analyze the markets. They go to where the money's paying. Um, they use benchmarks and, and they're adjusting every day to get better. They're not just getting in the truck and driving and taking what they get. Right. Um, on the flip side, the bottom 10% are the ones that just happen in to get in a truck. And I think I'll just go lease a truck today and I'll just keep driving and, you know, get the bump drawn in the road. They blow out a tire. They don't have any maintenance reserve built up and they got a business. And, you know, really that's the difference is people that treat it like a business and people that don't. Right. Um, you know, in terms of uh, business structure, just quickly, we're getting we're getting close to the ending time here for the for the uh, for the talk. But I, I've heard you talk a good bit about S corp, uh, the S corp business structure, and and there being a, a certain revenue um, a revenue threshold where it sort of begins to make sense for a single truck owner operator. I was wondering if uh, you, you could kind of explain the advantages there and, um, you know, kind of what's involved in setting that up, if it's possible in a short amount of time. Yeah, you bet. Um, this is a year to consider it if you're making a lot of money and you think that's going to go forward. Um, so the average driver is just a sole proprietor, files a simple schedule C with their tax return. If I'm making over $70,000 a year net income, um, I can set up an S corp to be taxed as an S corp. I can set up an LLC, but I can register to be taxed as an S corp, which simplifies things. And then I have to do payroll. So I have to actually pay myself out of my business and I have to pay myself a reasonable wage. And so to give you some simple numbers, let's just say a reasonable wage. I mean, it's it's not defined by the IRS very clearly. So I can I can do that myself, but we would tell you somewhere around 45 to $50,000 is a reasonable wage. So out of my business, I'm gonna pay myself, let's just say a thousand bucks a week, 52 grand but I'm gonna net 72,000 in my business. So there's a $20,000 differential. So I'm not gonna pay self-employment tax of 15% on that 20 grand between 70 and 50. So I'm gonna save $3,000 in taxes. It's gonna cost me some money to set up that S corp and do payroll. Probably cost me about 1500. So in the end, I'm gonna be net net to the good about 1500, but we got drivers. If I'm making 80,000, 90,000, 100,000 plus, for sure, this structure makes sense for you. And it's, it's totally legal. Um, the way you get that other $20,000 out of your business, because you're only paying yourself a thousand a week, but you made 70, is you can do a distribution out of your business, you know, quarterly or at the end of the year, um, I made money and I'm just distributing income out of my business. So you're gonna pay income tax on that, just like you would either way, but you're not gonna pay that self-employment tax. So it's a totally legitimate, um, we've done it for 20 years. You know, if I pay myself a thousand dollars a month, only twelve thousand dollars, nobody, no truck driver makes twelve thousand dollars a year. So I'm going to get in trouble with the IRS for that. So you know, there's got to be some parity, and we can walk you through the numbers. But um, when you're making a lot of money in a market like this, it makes sense to do. And, We've know, set up a lot of S corps this year. Yeah, and I've also, you know, people that have done this that have often remarked to me that you know, doing their treating themselves as a sort of employee and paying themselves a salary 
uh, starts to uh, change their way of thinking about the business and and it, and kind of you know because it separates you know you as a driver from from the, the the business profit and so you know your efforts to grow that profit become this I don't know, it just becomes this other thing in their mind and uh, in some cases you know pe- people have described that as a as a kind of a you know, mental stepping stone, in addition to, you know, all the tax advantages that you just mentioned, uh, toward, you know, being able to truly manage, uh, handling, uh, manage, manage, uh, adding another truck, you know, hiring another employee, because you're going to have to treat them the same way. Um, any thoughts on that, in that regard, uh, in terms of just, I don't know, the, 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 the benefits of thinking about, uh, yourself as, owner operator, uh, you know, business versus me as driver. Has it, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think you're hundred percent right, Todd, because that's when we talk about the top 10%, that's the kind of things they do, right? They set up a personal budget and here's what it costs me to live at home is, uh, right. is that 50,000 or 52,000, a thousand a week. So I'm going to leave that actually 20,000 still in my business. And when I do that for three or four years, you know, I've got 60 grand built up in my business. Now I can pay off my truck. Now I can go buy my second or third truck rather than just living hand to mouth and everything I get in my paycheck, I'm going to blow on, you know, whatever I want to buy. Um, that's a real business person that's paying themselves as an employee and treating it like a true business. So hundred percent, I'm with you. Some do it to save on taxes and the side benefit is it turns them into a legitimate business owner. Well, thanks Todd. I really appreciate uh, you walking, walking, walking through us, uh, walking us through everything today. Uh, we're about out of time. Uh, I want to thank everybody for, for tuning in and, uh thanks thanks for participating again todd and thanks for all the folks that asked uh, dropped questions in here i will um you know in the aftermath of this um if you, if you continue to have questions or if you're watching the replay of this feel free to drop them in the comments i um i can i can certainly get them over to todd or todd todd shared his uh his phone number early feel free to reach out to him and the folks at atbs for you know any uh any big business questions reach out to us at Overdrive. We'll put you in touch as well. Um, and if we don't have answers, yeah, we, we, we can put you in touch with somebody that does, right? Yeah, Todd. So uh, we've had a long partnership with Overdrive. Uh, Partners Business Program is awesome. It's educated a lot of people along the years and uh, we just appreciate the relationship and thanks for having me on and uh, God bless all you out there doing the work every day. Thank you for what you do. Yep. 10-4 and uh, ditto for me. Uh, before I close out, I'll share, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a link to, to check out the Partners in Business program. And there's uh, numerous stories there. You can download the manual. Holly did drop that link in the chat, by the way, um, to the manual download. But the, the link to, to check out is overdriveonline.com slash partners in business with hyphens in between those last three words there. Overdriveonline.com partners in business. And thanks, everybody. I'm going to end this uh, stream here right now. See you next time.